April is sexual.
Okay, now stand over here and see how it is. Yeah, much Good? better. Much better? Yeah. This? Yeah, yeah, much better. Thank you, sir. Do we need to move this one or you? No, um. Can we, we can bring it down. Probably. probably bring it down, yeah. But there's other mics around it, yeah. so that's the thing. Yeah, move the flag closer. Yeah, move the Oh, I thought you, you were talking about the flags. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Who? Is it, is it frame up all right? Who, do you know who this is? Um, yeah. uh, do we think that we moved any of the mics? Or we think no, we they were real careful. Are okay. we ready? Yeah, I'll give the two minute warning. Okay. Run. Two minutes. Two minute warning. Where's it go? Uh, all right. I, no, I think everything's fine. That works so much better. Okay. We're going to cut off this head. Okay. Of the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, speaking in two minutes. We're good. We'll, we'll turn. Two minutes. Two minutes. Get that. Is that the stage okay? Yeah, this is all good. Testing, testing. exciting hey thank you good morning it's a pleasure for me to be with you and I want to thank our superb brave men and women of the Customs and Border Protection uh, for their hospitality uh, their ICE officers our HSI officers who work every day to restore a lawful system of immigration that we can be proud of I appreciate uh, Secretary Kelly uh, for his leadership and his willingness to uh, have his people host me today. I appreciate that and all of Homeland Security. Um, our men and women who are securing our border are making astounding progress. Here along our nation's southwest border is ground zero in the fight. Here under the Arizona sun Ranchers uh, work each day to make an honest living, uh, and law-abiding citizens seek to provide for their families. But it's also here, along this border, that transnational gangs like MS-13 and international cartels flood our country with drugs and leave death and violence in their wake. And it is here that criminal aliens and the coyotes and the document forgers seek to overthrow our lawful system of immigration. So let's stop here for a moment. When we talk about, is it, when we talk about MS-13 and the cartels, what do we mean? 
we mean international criminal organizations that turn cities and suburbs into war zones, that rape and kill innocent civilians, and who profit by su smuggling poison and other human beings across our borders. Depravity and violence are their calling cards, including brutal machete attacks, even beheadings. They threaten the very integrity of our nations in our hemisphere. It is here on this sliver of land, on this border, where the first we first take our stand. A direct, uh, it is a direct threat to our legal system and to our peace and prosperity. In this fight, I'm here to tell you, the brave men and women of the Customs and Border Protection, we hear you. We hear your concerns. We have your back. Under the President's leadership and guided by his executive orders, we will secure this border and bring the full weight of both the immigration courts and the federal enforcement and prosecutors to combat this attack on our national security and our sovereignty. As all know, the President has made this a priority and, has, and already we're seeing results. From January to February of this year, illegal crossings dropped by 40 percent, which was an unprecedented drop. Then, last month, we saw a 72 percent drop compared to the month before, a month before the President was inaugurated. That's the lowest monthly figure in 17 years. We are so proud of your work. But, all, but this is no accident. This is what happens when you have a president who understands the threat, who is not afraid to publicly identify the threat and to stand up to it, and who makes clear to law enforcement that the leadership of their country finally has their back and tells the whole world that the Ill illegality is over. So, and together, we will further drastically reduce the danger posed by criminal aliens, gang members, and cartel henchmen. To that end, the President, Secretary Kelly, and I want to do our best to arm you our with, uh, with, the, with the support of our prosecutors and partner with you uh, with more tools in your fight against criminal aliens. The battle is far from over. We must follow up on the successes we've had so far, and here on the border, we will do so. So t today, I'm pleased to stand with you, our law enforcement officers, and to announce new guidance regarding our commitment at the Department of Justice uh, to criminal enforcement of Im our immigration laws. And as we speak, I am issuing a document to all federal prosecutors that mandates the prioritization of these immigration enforcement. Starting today, federal prosecutors are now required to consider for prosecution all of the following offenses, often not prosecuted in the past. The transportation and harboring of aliens. As you know too well, this is a booming business. No more. We're going to shut down and jail those who've been profiting from this lawlessness. Smuggling gang members across the border, helping convicted criminals re-enter the country, and preying on those who don't know how dangerous and costly this journey can be. Further, where an alien has unlawfully entered the country, which is a misdemeanor, that alien will now be charged with a felony if they unlawfully enter or attempt to enter a second time and certain aggravating circumstances are present. Also, aliens that illegally re-enter the country after prior removal will be referred for felony prosecution, and priority will be given to such offenses, especially where indicators of gang or cartel affiliation or risk to public safety, drug smuggling, or criminal history are present. Fourth, where possible, prosecutors are directed to charge criminal aliens with document fraud and aggravated identity theft, the latter carrying a two-year minimum mandatory penalty. 
Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I have directed that all 94 United States Attorney's offices make the prosecution of assaults on federal officers uh, a priority. Assaults on you as you go about doing your duties. A, if someone dares to assault one of our folks in the line of duty, they will do federal time for it. You're very often away from uh, backup out in dangerous areas, and the smugglers and the uh, drug dealers need to know that they will, we will not tolerate any attacks on our federal officers. To, to ensure that these priorities are implemented, start, uh, starting today, each United States Attorney's Office, whether border or interior, will designate an assistant United States Attorney as the border coordinator in that district. It will be this experienced prosecutor's job to coordinate the criminal investigation and enforcement response for their specific office. For those that continue to seek improper and illegal entry into this country, be forewarned. This is a new era. This is the Trump era. The lawlessness, the abdication of duty to enforce our laws and the catch and release policies of the past are over. In that vein, I'm also pleased to announce a series of reforms regarding immigration judges to reduce the significant backlogs in our immigration courts. Backlogs and catch and release uh, policies have undermined the effectiveness of our law officers' work. Pursuant to the President's executive order, we will now be detaining all adults who are apprehended at the border. They will not be released. To support this mission, we have already surged 25 immigration judges to detention centers along the border. And I want to thank personally the many judges who answered our call to support this initiative. In addition, we will put 50 more immigration judges on the bench this year and 75 next year. We can no longer afford to wait 18 to 24 months to get these judges on the bench. So today I've implemented a new streamlined hiring plan. It requires just as much vetting as before of their skills and expertise, but reduces the hiring time. We must end the backlogs in our immigration courts. With the President's executive order on border security, transnational criminal organizations and public safety as our guidepost, we will execute a strategy that once again secures our border, apprehends and prosecuted those criminal aliens that threaten public safety, and takes the fight to gangs like MS-13 and Los Zetas and makes dismantlement and destruction of cartels a high priority. We will deploy a multifaceted approach. We are going to interdict your drugs on the way into this country, your money on the way out, and investigate and prosecute your trafficking networks to the fullest extent of the law. Why are we doing this? Because it's what the duly enacted laws of the United States require. I took an oath to protect this country from all enemies foreign and domestic. On behalf of our people, Congress has set very generous rules for immigration. The people have pleaded, however, with Congress and with their leaders to enforce those good rules uh, for many, many years. They have often gotten promises from their leaders, but no action. Now is the time for action. Now is the time we will have results. How else can we look at parents and loved ones of Kate Steinle and so many others in the eye and say we're doing everything possible to prevent such tragedies in the future. Let me finish where I started. First, by thanking you, the officers who serve our country so effectively. You are on the front lines of this fight. You are doing historic work at this point in our uh, nation's existence. I know we ask a tremendous amount from all of you. But know this, 
We have your back. We will do what we can to empower and support you in all your work. We will establish a system of immigration that serves the national interest, and one that we can be proud of, one that is, is lawful. God bless all of you who do this work, and give, have, we ask God's blessing on the success of this effort to improve the lawlessness and safety of our country. Thank you. Hey, Nancy. Um, I, I've covered the border for 30 years, traveling back and forth. What do you say to people who charge that your policies are going to create more jobs than the border patrol is The American people have established a lawful procedure uh, for immigration in our country, a lawful procedure of entrance and exits. We have that right here. I think things are moving in a good direction here. We've made a lot of progress in recent years over uh, ending the illegality. I think the people of this country overwhelmingly want a lawful system of immigration that serves the national interest, one that we can be proud of. One, when somebody waits their turn, they know that they're going to have an opportunity in the future and that someone who comes in unlawfully doesn't break ahead of them. So I think that's what uh, uh, we are about today. I think that's what we're going to accomplish, and I think it's right and decent and good that we do so. Do you have any plans to meet with um, civil rights or human rights people along the border? I've met with a number of civil rights uh, leaders already. Uh, we discussed quite a number of issues. These issues have uh, really been out there for a long time. So what I would say to you is America has the most generous immigration system in the world. We admit 1.1 million people each year to permanent residence in this country. Uh, we're going to be a nation that admits immigrants into our country. We're going to have commerce with our neighbors, uh, but we're going to do it in a lawful way, and I think that's the right thing. The wall is a force multiplier of uh, great proportions. It is going to enable us, when we deport criminal aliens and others who've entered the country illegally, uh, that they don't get to come back as we're seeing today. The briefing I've had as we've been across the border today uh, indicates that quite a large percentage of the people that are now coming uh, have, are re-entering after having been deported, after having been convicted of, of crimes. So I think there's no doubt that the barrier, the wall, will have a great and positive impact, uh, and it will continue our ability uh, to follow through on a commitment to end the lawlessness. But if, if, it, if it's working and if you're introducing new policies that are working, why, why do you need the wall? Why the sense of urgency? And then on funding, uh, Secretary Tillerson said that... Well, on the wall, I just explained to you, we have uh, a good uh, a fence here. Uh, it has been very effective in helping to uh, curtail the illegal flow into the country. The officers told me that today as we went by and examined it. Uh, the next uh, structures will be even more effective and be in a lot of areas that we've said we were going to have uh, uh, barriers in before but have not yet been built. That's going to get done. And, and Secretary Tillerson, Do we have another question? Uh, are you planning to increase the number of civil... Uh, of, uh, Um, our people are going to be under strict discipline and orders to be uh, honor civil rights. We're going to conduct our operations in a, according to the highest standards. The police officers who fail to meet those standards will be disciplined. There's no doubt about that, and we're committed to that.
we want everybody to comply with the law uh, and because a child or uh, a family member enters the United States lawfully doesn't mean that others uh, can enter the country unlawfully. So we do have that challenge. We want people to understand that they're not entitled to enter unlawfully. We want the people to know that uh, the laws will be followed. And hopefully if we send this message that's already seeming to have an impact, we'll be able to uh, return to the kind of system that we can be proud of that uh, validates the people. Thank you all. It's uh, good to be with you. Take care.
outside today. Alright. Rose Garden Press Reference. Um, I want to uh, start off this afternoon by a quick comment on the tragic and heartbreaking events that unfolded at San Bernardino School yesterday. Uh, the events occurred after the briefing, so I just want to make sure I acknowledge that our thoughts and prayers go out to all the families of the three victims. Uh, we hope for a speedy and full recovery of those who were wounded uh, in the events that occurred. Uh, moving on to today, the President uh, this morning led a discussion with some of the world's top job creators on how private sector thinking can help the government modernize and provide a better, more efficient services uh, to the American people. Together, the companies that were represented in the room this morning employ nearly 4 million people worldwide and at least 1.78 million Americans here in our nation. Starting in small interactive groups, the Cabinet members shared their strategic visions for their departments and listened as business leaders offered their unique perspectives on how they might achieve those goals. The groups then came together and shared their discussions and outcomes with the President. The meeting was hosted by the American Office of, the Office of American Innovation and was another opportunity for the administration to engage with the private sector and harness its knowledge to develop innovative solutions to some of our country's biggest problems like crum the crumbling infrastructure and broken system at the Veterans Administration. Also this morning, the President completed several procedural steps to ratify the protocol for Montenegro's accession to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization following the Senate's overwhelming and bipartisan vote of advice and consent in support of this ratification. The United States looks forward to formally welcoming Montenegro as the 29th member of the NATO alliance. And later today, the President will have a series of meetings with his national and economic security team. Uh, later, the Attorney General is also at the southwest border to announce specific new actions uh, the Trump administration is taking to secure our borders and keep the country safe. Uh, the administration is committed to ending the practice of smuggling gangs and cartels across the border that flood our country with drugs and violence. These actions, which include a strengthening of the laws applying to those who are caught attempting to illegally return to the United States after prior removal, and those who profit off smuggling people across the border, will once again make it clear to the brave men and women of law enforcement that the Trump administration has their back. And Secretary Tillerson finished the G7 foreign ministers meeting today and is now in Moscow for meetings with his Russian counterpart. The visit is part of our effort to maintain direct lines of communication with senior Russian officials and to ensure that the United States' views on the situation in Syria, counterterrorism efforts, North Korea, and other matters are clearly conveyed. We're open to strategic cooperation with Russia when we can achieve a shared goal, such as defeating ISIS, but we'll stand up for our interests and values when we do not see eye to eye. Russia must fully honor the commitments it made on Syria, Ukraine, and the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and other topics of international concern. And Secretary Killerson is going to make that clear during his visit. I also want to make it known that uh, Secretary Mattis and General Votel, who's the uh, COCOM commander of Central Command, will be giving a full briefing on the strike in uh, Syria that occurred today at the Department of Defense at 3.30. Uh, then at 4 o'clock, I'll be back up here for an off-camera uh, briefing with Director Mulvaney of the Office of Management and Budget and OMB Senior Advisor Linda Springer for uh, regarding the President's executive order on reorganizing the executive branch. So that gives us three briefings plus this today. Uh, not to get you real excited, but we'll have another one tomorrow morning uh, in advance of the NATO uh, meeting with the Secretary General. Um, this afternoon's briefing will be discussing the plan on reforming the federal government and reducing the size of the federal civilian workforce that OMB was directed to produce by, um, by executive order. So we'll be spending a lot of quality time together over the next uh, 48, 24 hours. And with that, I'd be glad to uh, take a few questions. Ken. Sean, on Russia to start. Uh, does the administration believe that Russia had any advanced knowledge of this chemical attack in Syria? And does the administration believe that Russia may have been complicit in, in this attack? Um, I believe the there was a background briefing earlier today where that was discussed. Um, at this time, uh, there's no consensus in the intelligence community that that's, that's the case. Is there any is there any thought within the intelligence community? Are there some strands of the intelligence community? Uh, again, at this point, the only thing I'm going to say is that there's no consensus within the intelligence community that there was involvement. Annie? Um, today, uh, in the background briefing, um, 
Trump officials accused Russia of helping Syria cover up Assad's use of chemical weapons. In the past, Trump has praised Putin, calling him very smart and expressing his general admiration. Does this, does he still think Putin is very smart, and does this change the relationship between the two leaders? Well, I, I think I, a couple things. Number one, I think the president's made it clear from the beginning that um, that he entered office thinking that if he can get a deal with Russia in, in our national interest, which we I discussed during the opening remarks as part of Secretary Tillerson's conversation with uh, former Mr. Lavrov, then we're going to do it. Uh, but if we can't get a deal and if we can't find an area of national interest, then we won't. And in this particular case, it's no question that Russia is isolated. Uh, they have aligned themselves with North Korea, Syria, Iran. That's not exactly a group of countries that you're looking to hang out with. Uh, with the exception of Russia, they are all failed states. Um, there is clearly – and uh, Russia is not an island when it comes to uh, its support of Syria or its lack of, frankly, acknowledgement of what happened. The facts are on our side. Uh, the actions of Syria are reprehensible. Um, and I think that Russia has been party to several international agreements. Uh, that Syria is not holding up to, in fact, that, that Russia needs to hold themselves up to. So I think the President has been very clear with his stance on Russia, and in this particular case, we're going to be very forceful, and I think, uh, as will um, Secretary Tillerson during his visit, to make sure that we inf make sure that we let Russia know that they need to live up to the obligations that it has made. Caitlin. The administration has said sanctions against Syria are forthcoming. What will those look like, and when can we expect them? Uh, great question. Uh, I, I think you know well enough at this point that uh, we're not going to announce uh, any of that kind of action until it's, it's ready to go. I think the President's made it clear that additional action on, with respect to Syria in terms of its failure to um, stop engaging in actions that harm its people uh, will result in action. And, um, and so I'm not going to get ahead of what he is planning to announce or when, but as he has made clear on a variety of circumstances, uh, he's not one to telegraph his actions until he's ready to, to make those announcements. Secondly, has the administration identified an opposition party that could come to power in Syria if there is a regime change? I, I think first and foremost, and I stated this yesterday and we will state it again, that our number one goal is to defeat ISIS. That is unequivocally the number one thing. I think, secondly, uh, the political conditions that are exist in Syria right now are such that what we need Russia and others to do is to help create a political environment in which the Syrian people can um, choose a leader that, that is more suited to them. I, I think getting into who that should be, I think what we're trying to do right now is shape the environment to allow the Syrian people to determine their, their, their outcome. Blake. I'm going to change the topic into totally topics of the topics of that. Uh, Mark Meadows said earlier this morning that he thinks, quote, we're very close as it relates to health care and that two options were given to the House Speaker. Does the White House believe that you're very close on health care and are, have you signed off on those two options? Well, uh, two things. One, um, I think we're getting closer and closer every day. Um, this has been a process that, as you know, uh, the Chief of Staff, the Vice President and others have been extremely engaged in behind the scenes. Um, we clearly are getting closer. More votes are moving in our direction, um, and these ideas, I think, are very helpful, and the conversations are getting closer. I don't want to prejudge the outcome at this point, but I would say that we feel very buoyed by the direction that this is going and some of the outcomes. I know that with respect to a couple of the proposals that Congressman Meadows um, is suggesting, I mean, part of those has to be, again, uh, figuring out whether or not those attract uh, additional votes and gain additional support and don't detract. And I know it sounds very simple. But that's what this entire process has been about. And so he is reviewing a couple of the provisions that he wants to make an amendment or to the, to the ongoing amendment. Have you signed off to those two? Uh, it's not a question of us signing off. I think we're good uh, with the direction that this, that this is going um, as long as it continues to grow the vote. A lot of these provisions uh, that are being discussed give states the flexibility to enact certain provisions, uh, which is consistent with our general philosophy of. Um, giving more competition and more choice to the people in, in the state. So, and secondly, um, video that's being played across television, United Airlines. Do you think the government should investigate them, the industry as a whole, as it relates to passenger treatment? Um, I, I would just say that I, I think there has been clearly um, law enforcement is reviewing that situation. I think. There's plenty of law enforcement to review a situation like that. 
Um, and I know United Airlines has stated that they are currently reviewing their own policies. Um, let's, let's not get ahead of where that review goes. Um, it, was, it was an unfortunate uh, incident. Clearly, when you watch the video, it's, it is troubling to see how that was handled. Um, but I'm not going to – they have clearly stated their desire to review the situation. Law enforcement is reviewing it, and I think for us to start to, to get in front of, of what should be a very simple, you know, a local matter, um, not necessarily needing a, a federal response. Hallie. Uh, two questions. Just to follow up on Blake, just very briefly. Has the president seen that video? I'm sure he has. And what's his reaction? I, I don't think anyone looks at that video and isn't a little disturbed that another human being is treated that way. Um, but again, I don't – I think one of the things that people have to understand is that when there is a um, – a potential law enforcement matter to, for the for the president to weigh in pro or con would prejudice a potential outcome. So I don't want to get in, but I think clearly watching another human being drag down an aisle, um, watching you know blood come from their face after hitting an armrest and whatever, I, I don't think there's a circumstance that you can sit back and say this probably could have been handled a little bit better when you're talking about another human being. Um, but I again, I don't think that um, it is my place to get in the middle of judging how a company dealt with this. I think there's clearly going to be enough review, both on a corporate side and then on a law enforcement side, on how this was handled. But I, I think from a human-to-human -human standpoint, to watch a human being get dragged down an aisle with their head banging off armrests and not think that it could have been handled better, um, I, I would assume that we could probably all agree on that. John. Two yeah. questions, though. That was actually just a clarification. First, on uh, both foreign policy, one on Syria. Uh, this administration is continuing to fight for its travel ban that would, in part, limit refugees right. coming in from Syria. The president spoke very uh, starkly about how affected he was by some of the images that he's seen yes. of his youngest victims. There have also been images of refugees, like, for example, Island Curry, that have also been heart wrenching for people. Is the president giving any thought to reconsidering that aspect of his travel ban? In terms of letting them in? Correct. Well, I think. You've heard you've heard a lot of these refugees in particular talk about the fact they're not looking to flee. They want. You are looking to flee. I think that right. The and, and I think the number one goal of this president is to make sure that we protect <laughs> our people, our country, um, and to keep those people from um, from having to flee. They have family there, um, and so that's our number one goal: is creating a safer environment, de-escalating the conflict there. Um, is, is not to figure out how we people we can fly out. I think the U.S. has been extremely supportive when it comes to the financial piece of this um, and looking for ways to work with in a diplomatic fashion. But the goal isn't to figure out how many people we can just uh, import to this country. I think there's clearly a, a security concern that we have to be. Him also? They have touched him. And I think that's what he made very clear. That's why, you know, uh, with the uh, consent and guidance of his national security team, it was very extreme. It was moving. I don't think, I mean, going back, I don't mean to make two examples of this, but I don't think you can watch those those things. Not that you should have any human being, but when you see in particular young children and babies being gassed, uh, it, it should move any human being that has a heart. Um, so I, I think, but that, that, that partially dealt with why he acted so decisively, is to see an individual in Assad, in that regime, act in a way that, that reacted to, you know, we can't, we can't condemn every act, but I think to literally see someone use gas, um, and it was pointed out, you know, you think about that. It is, a, it is in the same category as nuclear weapons for a reason. It is that lethal. It is that deadly. It is that horrific that when you recognize that use of chemical weapons is put in the same category of weapons of mass destruction as so many other things because of what it does to an individual um, and the nature of an attack like that, that even first responders um, if you saw some of the tape, we're getting, you know, grossly affected by this. Uh, it, it moved him tremendously, and that's part of the reason he acted the way he did. On North Korea, Sean, I also know that you've seen the latest provocations from Pyongyang. The president tweeted this morning that if China won't help, the U.S. will solve the problem. That's right. What does he mean by that, solve I, I, the problem? Right. I think he has been very clear uh, that he will not tolerate some of this action by North Korea. But he's all, But to, to answer your question, I think I've said this before on a variety of topics. The president is not one who's going to go out there and telegraph his response. Um, I think he keeps all options on the table. He keeps his cards close to the vest. And as he showed uh, last week with respect to Syria, when the president is willing to act, it's going to be decisive and proportional uh, to make it very clear uh, what the position of the United States is. Now, that's not what I said. I just said that, as you know, when the president's ready to act, he makes it very clear 
Um, and I think there's no question that when the president is ready to make a statement, he will do that. But I think he has made it clear um, with respect to North Korea that their behavior and their actions with respect to the missile launches is not tolerable. The last thing we want to see is a nuclear uh, North Korea that threatens the, the coast of the United States, or for that matter, uh, you know, any other country and any other set of human beings. So we need stability in that region, um, and I think he has put them clearly on notice. John. Between Russia and Syria is a strong one. It goes back decades. Um, President Putin has supplied personnel, he supplied military equipment to the Assad government. What makes you think that at this point he's going to pull back in his support for President Assad and for the Syrian government right now? I think a couple things. You, you look, we didn't use chemical weapons in World War II. You know, you had a, you know, someone as despicable as Hitler. Who didn't even sink to the to the to using chemical weapons? So you have to, if you're Russia, ask yourself: Is this a country that you and a regime that you want to align yourself with? Uh, you have previously signed on to international agreements, rightfully acknowledging that the use of chemical weapons should be out of bounds by every country. To not stand up to not only Assad but your own word should be troubling. And this is Russia put their name on the line. Um, so it's not a question of how long that alliance has lasted, but at what point do they recognize that they are now getting on the wrong side of history in a really bad way really quickly? And again, look at the countries that are standing with them. Iran, Syria, North Korea. This is not, this is not a team you want to be on. Um, and I think that Russia has to recognize that while they may have had an alliance for them, that the lines that have been crossed are ones that no country should ever uh, want to see another country cross. Yeah. Uh, two seasonally related questions. Uh, first one coming up on tax day. When does the White House plan on releasing uh, President Trump's 2016 returns? And there are any concerns about uh, possible conflicts of interest reflecting on the tax debate that could be cleared up with this release? Uh, second, how many people are you expecting for the Easter egg roll? And will you be promising your previous uh, role in this fight? Uh, those are two tough ones. Um, <laughs> So on the first one, I think we've, we've asked and answered that several times, and the President's been under audit. I think when you look at we, – we filed our financial disclosure forms the other day um, in, a, in a way that allows everyone to understand, uh, and for those listening at home, um, you know, a tax return clearly lists how much money you made, how much tax you paid. When you look at a financial disclosure form, it lists every asset, every debt you owe, um, where you're getting your money from, where your income's derived from. It is a much more comprehensive understanding. I think the President, this, this question has been asked and answered over and over again. I think the American people are, frankly, the middle class in particular, and companies that are trying to grow here in the United States are much more concerned about tax reform and allowing our economy to grow and their bottom line to grow. Uh, with respect to the Easter egg role, uh, it's a huge topic. I appreciate that. Uh, um, I, I think we're going to have an excellent time. Uh, oh, come on. You can't ask the question. <laughs> And not get the answer, um, but I, I we're, uh, we have we have worked really well. I think we're going to have a a very very uh, enjoyable day on Monday. Uh, the tickets have been sent out to all the schools in the area. There'll be a large military contingent that will be participating as well. Um, and I know I think there's five waves uh, over two hour periods in which children and their families will be able to come to the White House. Uh, We've done extensive community outreach to really bring a lot of the school children and from the area in, and uh, and it's going to be a great day. Um, I, I don't have the number. I'd be glad. I think the, the East East Wing could probably get you an answer, and I'll make sure I, I put out that number. I think uh, they're they're working on the final numbers. They're starting ticket distribution, so I should be able to get you a number on that. Francesca. Thank you, Sean. You said last month that the White House was reviewing the policy on visitor laws. Right. Will the White House voluntarily release those visitor laws? I think we should have an answer on our policy uh, very shortly on that. Okay, and then a question on Syria. Secretary Tillerson said this morning that it was the United States' hope that Bashar al-Assad will not be part of Syria's future, but it's up to the people of Syria to make that determination. Uh, at the same time, uh, the question is now whether the White whether it's the White House's position that Assad's a bad actor and it would be ideal if he would go, or whether the White House thinks that the atrocities that he's committed are absolutely unacceptable and he must go, period. I don't, as I mentioned yesterday, I don't see a peaceful, stable Syria in the future that has Assad in charge. So he absolutely has to go, period. I think there's no question that you can't have a peaceful Syria um, with, with Assad in charge. I don't see that, that, how that ever works. So 
no, I don't see a future Syria um, that has Bashar al-Ashar as, as the leader of that government. Uh, Chris. Thanks, Sean. I want to ask you about some comments um, that Eric Trump made to Ivanka Trump. He said, uh, speaking of Ivanka Trump, Ivanka is a mother of three kids, and she has influence. I'm sure she said, listen, this is horrible stuff. My father will act in times like that. Did Ivanka Trump play a role uh, in President Trump deciding to strike Syria? And if so, what was that role? Well. I the president, I think we released um, last Friday a, a very comprehensive TikTok of, you know, when the president was informed by his national security team and how his thinking evolved. 10.30 last Tuesday, his national security team was giving him his daily presidential daily briefing. They went over what had gone on in Syria in detail. He began to ask a series of questions. Um, they came back to him later that day. There was a, a deputy principals meeting later on Tuesday. On Wednesday, there was a principals meeting. They continued to bring back with him a series of questions. and. Uh, responses to his thing, and, and his evolving his his uh, decision making process continued uh, aboard Air Force One on the way down to Florida. Four o'clock when he arrived in Mar-a-Lago, he had a, a national security team meeting both in Mar-a-Lago and VT, secure VTC back to different elements that were gathered uh, in secure locations. That's when he gave the order. Uh, that being said, there's no question that um, Ivanka and others weighed into him as as you know uh, it was asked earlier. Halley asked it. Um, that when he himself saw images, he was very, very moved. And I think Ivanka and others, frankly, I, I don't think that there's uh, many humans that came into contact with the president uh, during that window of time that said, did you see those images on television? Um, so I don't, you know, I, I think there was a, a widespread um, acknowledgement that the images and the actions that had been taken uh, were horrific and required action. And just to be clear, she was among those who supported taking action. I don't, I've not, I have not asked her what her person, but I, I think, uh, and again, I, I saw the reports that, that Eric gave, uh, but again, I don't think Ivanka stands any different than anyone else when it comes to the response uh, that, that we got. Do you know if they discussed the attack? I, I don't. She I, I gave her personal reaction. To I don't know, uh, but again, I don't think it's that dissimilar to what any human being probably would have asked. Just a couple of others. Um, he also said if there was anything that the strike on Syria did, it was to validate the fact that there is no Russia tie, which raises the question that there was some type of political component to this. Can you respond to that? In the sense that I, I – well, I guess my point – or I think his point would be after 80-plus <laughs> days of constantly being asked what the involvement is, I think clearly – with us acting, not having a conversation with Moscow in the political sense. Prior to that, I think it pretty is, uh, for all of the discussion about how many ties and back channels and this and that, it was a pretty clear uh, show of, of resolve and force that the United States was acting and, and not with anyone else's. So he wasn't suggesting that was a factor in the decision. No, I think it's, it, no, no, but I, I think that, you know, respectfully, I mean, every almost every single day we've been asked about these so-called ties and back channels and whatever, and I think there's an acknowledgment at some point that if that was true, you would have seen some kind of action that clearly didn't happen. And just to follow up on the North Korea question, yeah. uh, we, we Halle read the President's tweet. North Korea seemed to threaten the possibility of taking some type of nuclear action um, if the U.S launches another, what they see as another provocation. What, what is the specific reaction to that? Is the president I, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't, I think that there is, the, there's no evidence that North Korea has that capability at this time. So I don't know that that could happen. Uh, that being, making that threat? Well, I, I don't think that threatening something that you don't have the capability of isn't really a threat. Kevin. Thank you, Sean. I want to sort of follow up on that. Uh, the president in his tweet uh, noted that uh, China could certainly help on the North Korean issue. And when you unpack it through that lens and the fact that the USS Carl Vinson sort of uh, steaming up toward the uh, Sea of Japan, that may be an additional pressure to maybe get China to come to the table. Is that an accurate read of what the President would like to see them do to really apply the pressure on Pyongyang? Well, I, I think the, the President and President Xi discussed this last week in, in uh, Florida. China has had a very economic and political influence on North Korea over the years. And I think that uh, when it comes to a shared national interest of ensuring that Korea doesn't obtain the nuclear capabilities to threaten any people, 
Um, that is something that we should all agree upon and something that he talked about with President Xi as an area of shared national interest. Uh, and I think that uh, North Korea clearly understands where the United States stands on this, and I think he would welcome uh, President Xi uh, weighing in on this a little bit more. Uh, so I think that's, you know, obviously wants to make it very clear to, to them and the rest of the country uh, and the rest of the world uh, what our what our position is. Putting that strike carrier group in the Sea of Japan in that region, is that also a messaging uh, circumstance or is that simply protective for our allies in Japan and Korea? You know, when you a, a carrier group is several things. Uh, the forward deployment is, is deterrence, presence, um, it's prudent, um, but it does a lot of things. It ensures our, our um, we have the strategic capabilities and it gives the president options in the region. But I think when you see a, a carrier group steaming into an area like that, uh, the forward presence of that is clearly, uh, through almost every instance, a, a, a huge deterrence. Um, so I think it serves multiple capabilities. Last one, yeah. if I might, on infrastructure and taxes. Uh, the CEO is obviously very interested in trying to get something done as quickly as possible. A, shovel-ready opportunities for people to get to work, and obviously a lowering of the taxes to enhance business expansion and perhaps even lower for middle class Americans. But I'm wondering if there isn't a health care component that needs to happen before you can move forward on that. So there's a, a few things. Uh, obviously getting health care, the repeal and replace done, uh, would open the amount of money that we can use through the reconciliation process uh, to have available to tax reform. That's why we made it very clear from the beginning that we thought health care should go first. It gives us a greater amount of, of uh, resources to dedicate to tax reform. That being said, um, there's under every circumstance you're talking months of getting tax reform done. Uh, that's one area that, the, that they discussed today. But one of the more important areas and where I think you're seeing the President act continuously and decisively is on the regulatory front. And that's one of the, the largest burdens that manufacturers, unions, um, entrepreneurs talk to the President about over and over again is the stifling regulations of a variety of sort uh, that prevent them, the coal industry, the manufacturing sector, the auto sector, um, over and over again are talking about the regulatory and the President's ability to take immediate action. I've mentioned it here before, but I mean, so far under the Congressional Review Act, this President signed 12 pieces of legislation. That compares to one that was signed in every administration prior to this year, um, total. And I think that that shows the President's commitment to creating not just a better tax climate, which is going to take a few months, but an immediate regulatory impact that can help businesses uh, break down the barriers, compete more, bring more jobs back to the United States. Cecilia. Thanks. I just want to give you the opportunity to clarify something you said that seems to be Thank gaining you. some traction right now. Uh, quote, Hitler didn't even sink to the level of using chemical weapons. What did you mean by that? I, I think when you come to sarin gas, uh, there was no – he was not using the gas on his own people the same way that a shot is doing. I mean, there was clearly. I, I, I understand your point. Thank you. I uh, thank you. I appreciate that. There was not in the in the he brought him into the to um, to the Holocaust Center. I understand that. But I'm saying in the way that Bash Assad used them, where he went into towns, dropped them down to innocent into the middle of towns. It was brought to it. So the use of it. And I appreciate the clarification there. That was not the intent. Okay. Uh, did the president speak with? Secretary Tillerson before he went on this trip to Russia, and is this stern message that the Secretary delivered today a direct message from the President to Vladimir Putin? I'm sure, yeah, I mean, they they spoke, he was in Florida with him before, before he left, and they, they met uh, Tillerson and the President uh, after his meeting with uh, President Xi concluded, uh, and they've talked, I think, since then as well. So this message, this, these, these pretty stark, harsh words from, from the Secretary Tillerson this morning about uh, about Russia, is that, can that be I, I don't as know. a message I mean, from I, I, Look, I'm not going to, I, I don't know that the nature of their final conversations, and I know there's been some evolution of, of the intelligence that we have and the actions that have been taken since, um, since Friday. So I don't know where the conversations have laid off, uh, but I think Secretary Tillerson clearly speaks on behalf of the United States in the President's position. John. John yeah. Thank you, Sean. Um, two foreign policy-related questions. You're speaking about Secretary Tillerson's trip, and I'd like to do a follow-up on the question I asked two weeks ago. Is he scheduled to meet with Mr. Navalny or Mr. Khodorkovsky or any of the civil society representatives outside of government? I'll 
refer you back to State Department the same way I did two weeks ago. I, I think they are in charge of his schedule. So I, I think it's best to look at the State Department. And has the President or anyone in the administration been in touch with President Erdogan on all of the actions in Syria? I, I do believe that uh, someone, either the Vice President or the Secretary of Defense spoke with him last week, but I'd have to check. I know there was a series of foreign leader and head of government calls uh, to both Defense Minister and, and heads of state, but I, I'd have to check. I thought he was on that list, but I, off the top of my head, I cannot recall. Major. You said, Bob, that uh, you hoped that Secretary Tillerson would be able to clearly convey to the Russians the sentiments of the U.S. government. Is that enhanced by a meeting directly with the Secretary and President Putin? And if there is no meeting like that, would the President of the United States consider his Secretary of State snubbed by the Russian President? Well, obviously, he's going to meet with uh, Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov. That's his counterpart. I think that's the job of a Foreign Minister and a Secretary of State to meet with each other. They're the counterparts. And I think that if he didn't meet with, uh, with President Putin, that he can convey his sentiments and thoughts of the United States to the Foreign Minister. Would the history of Putin meeting with Kerry and previous Secretaries of State influence the President's judgment on that? We'll have to see. I'm not going to. I mean, we're, we're not there yet. So I, I think to, to prejudge the outcome of, of the it's visit. The president, in other words, for Tillerson to see Putin on this visit, even though there are very no, but specific I would say that you want to convey to the No, no, but, the but I government. would say that, that there's a bit of irony that for all of these talks that have been perpetuated about back channels and, and direct links, that, that now it's, well, they won't meet with you, and does that undermine the relationship that I, I've heard time and time again? No, I understand that, but I, I, but I think it's interesting that we went from all of these direct links to Russia to now, are we disappointed that we can't even get a meeting with them? There's a bit of irony in your question. That I don't know. I don't even understand your point. They, they I'm asking you at a time after the United States has called out Russia for a disinformation right. campaign in Syria for collusion with a government it regards as carrying out a war crime, meeting with the Russian president. Is it or is it not a priority for this president to have his secretary of state convey that directly? He is conveying that message. And that's what he's they doing. But, but if, if the head of the Russian government won't meet with him, then he's going to convey it to his counterpart. And I'm asking you if that. And I just said we're not there yet, but I think right now. No, I, I think the answer is that he's meeting with his counterpart. That's his, that's the appropriate person for him to convey that with, and we'll have to wait and see how the meeting goes. Steve, uh, the Russian president today said that all this talk from the White House about weapons of mass destruction reminds him of what he heard from the White House in 2003. Uh, this White House is expressing confidence that sarin gas was used. What do you say to skeptics in Moscow and maybe in other countries, perhaps here at home, who doubt that level of confidence? I think you, you know. You had a – there was a 45-minute briefing uh, with members of the national security team prior to this, which they walked through all of that level of confidence that they have. I think that anybody who doubts that in terms of the pictures that were shown and the media that was there wouldn't just be doubting the intelligence, but it would be doubting the entire uh, international uh, reporting crew that was there to document all of this. There have been doctors, intelligence communities, media. I mean, I, I don't think it takes – uh, mere eyeballs to recognize what's happening and, and happened throughout there. So it's not a question of doubting us, it's doubting everybody but Iran, Syria, North Korea, Russia. Because in one other historical villain who used chemical weapons against his own people was Saddam Hussein. It was the policy of the United States government that there should be regime change in Iraq as a result of that kind of thing. So why shouldn't it be the same policy towards Bashar al-Assad? I, I think that you're there, – there's – you're trying to act as if – or the, the premise of the question suggests that we don't want – a new leader. I think I've stated now two days in a row that we don't see any um, a, a peaceful or stable Syria in the future that has Assad as, a, as the head of it. Their number one priority right now for us as a government is to make sure that we stop the threat of I, threat of ISIS and uh, and bring stability to that region. But make no question about it, there is no peaceful and stable Syria in the future that Assad is the head of. That's it. That's it. Point blank. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to clarify, um, is, is the U.S. position as far as cooperation with Russia that Russia must is, – is that Russia must uh, admit or uh, agree that Syria was behind the chemical attack and then also to do – that Russia must disown Assad? Like, can cooperation happen? if Russia maintains its position that Syria was not behind that chemical well, it's attack? Not just, it's not just behind it. I think that Russia has has joined an international agreement um, 
regarding the, the not just the use the possession of it was Susan Rice who went out and said that Syria no longer had uh, access to chemical weapons we know that's not true um, I think that the United States Russia and others uh, signed an international agreement that Syria was part of that said that they would not not only use but possess chemical weapons the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we enforce the existing agreement that Russia is a partner to. That's first and foremost. And I think we need to make sure that we do that because it is in the national interest of the United States to make sure that the proliferation of chemical weapons spreads no further. And that, that is something that we've got to be very careful. It's not just the deterrence of future use uh, within those people, but also the proliferation of them uh, throughout the world. But at this point, Russia is not even agreeing with the U.S. contention that that the Syrian government carried out the attack. So I, I understand that, and, and I think they, that Secretary Tillerson has just landed a few hours ago, and I think uh, we'll have an opportunity to talk to them. But again, you've got to. Th this is not. I, I don't. You, you know, as I as I just mentioned to Steve a second ago. I mean. You realize that Russia is in an island on this. They are not, this is not some big split as to how this actually happened. The only countries that aren't supporting the U.S.'s position are Syria, North Korea, Iran, and Russia. This is not exactly, you know, a, a happy time cocktail party of people that you want to be associated with. Uh, they are failed states with the exception of Russia. So these individual states, this is, when, when, when Russia is saying that they don't agree with us, they are not siding with uh, other nations of stature. They are agreeing with failed states and a small number of those as it stands. I think uh, they are staring in the defiance or they, they are staring, they are defiant in, in, the, in the world view uh, that doctors, intelligence agencies, reporters, civilians, international experts have all looked at and come to the same conclusion except for them. I don't think there's any other outcome uh, than that. With that, guys, I'll see you back in a little bit. I know we're going to have one more out of our three. Thank you. Joining the Astana talks. All right, folks, thank you very much for joining us and choosing us as your stream of choice. If you are new to our community, hit that subscribe button. Also, click the notification bell so you can get a heads up on when we go live. And um, it looks like there's going to be two more pressers today, uh, one that has to do with the State Department and the other one that's going to be with Sean Spicer. But it's going to be a gaggle, so there's no cameras allowed, only audio. I'm going to see if I'm gonna, I can get footage of that. So stay tuned on the channel, and uh, you'll get the notification if we do go live. Also, um, I just want to say something real quick. If you didn't know, here on YouTube, there's quite a few people that uh, stream Sean Spicer, stream Donald Trump, uh, stream the Senate, all that stuff. But... Well, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that only two, maybe even three, are actually Americans here in the United States that are streaming. Every single one of them, all of them, every single one of them, is, uh, of the other people other than three, myself, uh, Fox 10 Phoenix, and another one, are American. The rest are all foreigners streaming Trump, all for pure profit. So if you see a channel that has Trump's face on it as the avatar, and it says President Donald Trump speeches or President Donald Trump conference or uh, Donald Trump speeches and conference or rally or whatever. If anything in between that, that are foreigners, they're either one of them is Mexican, the other one's Indian, the other one's Peruvian, and the last one I think is from Norway or from the Netherlands, one of those two. None of them are American. 
All those are all foreigners that hate the United States, hate Trump, and only do it for monetary gain. I know that a lot of you guys are on other streams, you know, like uh, Fox streams, CNN streams, MSNBC streams. Spread the word. All of these people are all foreigners streaming Spicer, streaming Trump, streaming uh, the Senate, all that stuff. And they are not even Americans. The, 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 what's it called? Um, all those channels are a cesspool when it comes to their, their, their chat. They can care less about the government. They can care less about Trump. They can care less about Spicer or any of those guys because they're not in the United States. They're not in the United States and they only do it just to make money. So like we're, we're trying to basically spread the word of what Trump says. You support American. You encourage American. So that's what we're asking today is for you guys to help us out, spread the word that if you see a channel that is streaming Spicer, that is streaming uh, Trump or anything like that, and it has Trump's face or Trump's, uh, you know, the, the avatar is Trump, those are all foreigners streaming Trump for monetary gain because they, they're just laughing at Americans' faces making money off of Americans. The whole point of President Trump is to say, you know what, don't let these foreigners uh, take advantage of Americans. That was the whole thing. That was the whole, that was the whole reason why uh, President Trump won the election. So all of these people that have like again that have president trump as their avatar and they're they have the the following words president trump speeches and conference president trump uh speeches and rallies president trump or donald trump speeches and conference or anything in between any of those variations they're all foreigners and we ask patriots not to support them we ask, we ask patriots not to watch them because, like I said, they hate the United States of America. They hate President Trump.